Hello, welcome to Inside the Summit League. We are joined this week by Jay Elson, who covers the University of South Dakota for us here at Midco Sports Network. And he is here because the Coyotes have gone and won the Women's National Invitational Basketball Tournament. This is something no other Summit League team, men or women, has ever done. And how was this run uh, for this Coyote team, Jay? Was it surprising, mildly surprising maybe, or was this a total shock that they went all the way and won the whole thing? Well, I think there was an element of surprise in, in that, like you just mentioned, no other Summit League team had, had ever won a national tournament before in any sport, men or women, but no other team had ever reached the final right. for that matter. So uh, to that degree, yeah, a little bit of surprise just because it's something that you really have to wrap your head around. 64-team tournament, and they went and won six games, and here they are, national championship or national champions to a, to a certain degree. But... All that considered, I mean, this was a very good basketball team. They were 15-1 and one during the regular season in the Summit League play and swept South Dakota State for the first time in a very long time. I mean, that's an impressive feat. Made it all the way to the tournament title game and, and lost there and came up a bit short. And I feel like a lot of people thought they were deserving of an at-large bid in the NCAA tournament, but everyone here understands that right now this is a one-bid league and you got to win your tournament championship to get in. They didn't. Uh, but they set their goals. They were able to shift that goal into this next yeah. best thing, which was the NIT. And uh, from from the very start, it was pretty clear that uh, this team had something going. And uh, they, their, the desire was there. They got over the disappointment quickly enough to, to make something happen here. Certainly a team that looked capable of doing something yeah. special. This special, I, I'm not sure that anybody really expected that outside of that locker room. I think those girls believe from the, from the word go. But with the team they had, Seacamp and He Miller, and this uh, team that they had, all these seniors, uh, they certainly got it done. And just like the NCAA tournament, you got to win six games to win the WNIT. And USD starts it out at home with a 74 to 68 win over Creighton. So, so far, so good. Yeah, got off to a bit of a slow start in this game. I, it felt like the, the offensive hangover that was there in the Summit League uh, Tournament Championship game made Maybe carried over a little bit, but they came out after halftime, had a very strong second half, uh, and, and really took control of this game at that point. Ty Hemeler was fantastic, 17 points, 4 of 5 shooting, had 4 rebounds. Nicole Seacamp did her thing, 15 points, 6 rebounds, 6 assists. Uh, just a really, you know, a collective effort, especially in that second half. They got 15 points off turnovers, and they hit their free throws, which proved to be a, a big part of the difference in this game. 18 out of 21 at the free throw line, and the Coyotes make 10 threes in this win over Creighton, and that would be kind of a theme going forward here. So on to the second round. This was the only road game that the Coyotes would play of the six at Minnesota, mm -hmm. and a USD puts up 101 points, and they win it by 12. They needed 101 points yeah. because Minnesota's got a player by the name of Rachel Banham who, who certainly was as good as advertised. She put up 37 points in this game, but the key here, Tom, was the fact that she needed 32 shots. Kobe Bryant-esque shot number there uh, to get to that 37, and I thought the Coyotes did a, did a good job defensively, even though they gave up 89 points, to, to force her to take that many shots. She never got real comfortable, and, she, and frankly, at times, it felt like she was forcing things uh, to try and get Minnesota back in that game, and, and she needed to because the Coyotes were absolutely in rhythm from the word go offensively on this day. Uh, Kelly Stewart tied her career high with 19 points. She shot 8 of 14 from the field. Seacamp had 18 points, but she had a career high with 14 assists in this game. The Coyotes shot it very well from three. Caitlin Duffy had five of those. They led by 18 points with eight minutes and change to go in this game. He felt like they were just going to absolutely run away with it. Bantam, though, uh, brought her team back. They closed within five a couple of different times, uh, but USD never let them get over the hump, able to hold them off at Williams Arena and get that win. And it was at this point that I started to feel like this was a real possibility of them making a really deep run in this tournament. I'm not so sure at this point I was ready to say they were going to win it, but I was getting close. After this next game is when I kind of jumped yeah. on the bandwagon and thought those same things. And third round, uh, the game that almost trips the Coyotes up at home against Northern Iowa. And the Yotes pull out a one-point win in this one, 51-50. to 50. Yeah, uh, good old-fashioned rock fight in this one. There wasn't a whole lot of offense to be uh, talked about. Uh, in fact, USD just shot 39%. They were 2 of 15 from 3. You and I, though, 1 of 13 yeah. from 3. The difference, again, part of it anyway, came at the free throw line. USD only shot six of them all night, but they made all six. You and I missed five of them, 10 of 15 at the free throw line. 
Uh, and so USD able to get the win here. 16 points, six assists again for Nicole Seacamp. She was the only coyote even to reach double figures in this game uh, as, as USD avenges a 21-point loss to the That's Panthers right. in the second night of the regular season. Of course, Seacamp didn't play in that game. Comes back to prove to be part of the difference for the Oats in getting a win and moving on to the quarter five. Yeah, they scored 50 points less than they did at Minnesota, <laughs> but uh, they get by Northern Iowa as well. And then uh, USD really put together great back-to-back -back games in the next two rounds. Mm -hmm. In the quarterfinals against Western Kentucky, Coyotes really take control in the second half of this game, and they win it by 14, 68 to 54. Yeah, it was 31 apiece at the break, but but USD, as it has so often this season, comes out plays very strong after the break. I don't want to call them a second-half team because they were too good to be labeled like that but they were really good a lot of times after the halftime and that was the case on Easter Sunday they outscored the Hilltoppers 37 to 25 over the final two quarters and uh, Seacamp leading the way again 18 points nine more assists Kelly Stewart just one rebound shy of a double double here she had a very good tournament as well another one of those seniors as South Dakota reaches 30 wins for just the second time in program history uh, but a, an impressive win over a Western Kentucky team that was coming off an overtime win at St. Louis the previous game. And they follow that up with another impressive win onto the semifinals at home. Intermillion taking on Oregon. And was this the best game of the year that they played? It was the best game that I saw USD play all it, year. It was the best game, yes, certainly. I think that's fair to say, uh, including at both ends of the floor, especially when you when you factor both of those things in. I mean, this, this was an incredible offensive show. Made no everything. question about it. Every Thing that that uh, if you watched it you couldn't help but be entertained. Yeah. Uh, USD just ridiculous. 15 to 21 from three, 71 percent. Oregon came in as the number one three point shooting team yeah. in the country. They were at 52 percent from three in the WNIT. The, the Coyotes hold them to five of 14. Never let those duck shooters get comfortable in this one. So they finish at 35 percent. Coyotes build a 14 point halftime lead. But boy, they came out again after the break in that third quarter, and that's when the game was just done and over with. 29 to seven, they outscore Oregon in that third third frame. They put six players in double figures. Stewart and Abigail Fogg finished with 14 apiece. He Miller 13 and six assists. Caitlin Duffy was coming off the bench for the final three games of this tournament. Uh, due to an ankle injury, she comes off, gives him a real spark, particularly in that first half with a couple of big three-pointers. She finishes with 12, all of them coming from beyond the arc, uh, four of five from three on the night. 5,080 people packed into the Dakota Dome to see this game, and boy, did they get their money's worth. And that was not as packed as it would get for the yeah. next game. And those 15 threes by the Coyotes, by the way, in this game, not a season high. They made 17 at Kansas State uh, in the preseason, but uh, 15 threes for the Oats as they beat Oregon by 34 to get to this past Saturday in Vermillion. Florida Gulf Coast coming in to the championship game with 33 wins, mm -hmm. and it was close, but the Coyotes win it by six. Taya He Miller for USD, maybe the best game of her career oh, in the, in her last game. What a way to go out. I mean, she finishes with 22 points, 18 of those in the second half. She goes eight rebounds, six assists, ends up on the all WNIT tournament team. This Florida Gulf Coast team, though, was, was good. extremely good. A very, very talented team. When I saw the, the other side of the bracket being Michigan or Florida Gulf Coast, this was the matchup I was hoping for just in terms of what it, it looked like it was going to be. A lot of people were talking about South Dakota and Florida Gulf Coast being the two biggest snubs in the entire NCAA tournament field. So how appropriate that we get to see them play for a different championship here. Uh, the, the, the Coyotes administration ponies up, puts the money up to be able to host this game. That's one of the unique parts about this, this postseason uh, opportunity is that you can host these games. Uh, David Herbster, Jim Abbott, uh, and the rest of the administration do that. They get this game on their home floor. And boy, did the Coyote fans respond as well, Tom. 7,400 plus turned out in Vermillion. That's 70, mm, 7,300 plus that were Coyote fans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was all red and it was it was quite an environment, but just a, just an absolutely perfect storm of a day for them. They put it all together. Um, Florida Gulf Coast gave them everything they could handle, especially down the stretch. The Coyotes looked like maybe they were pulling away uh, about halfway through the third quarter, uh, but FGCU came back, got within one, never got over the hump, though. The Coyotes never let that lead slip away, and I thought that was an important part of this. All right, here is uh, Nicole Seacamp uh, after they win the whole thing. Uh, this is unreal. I was saying to someone else that, you know, this time a year ago, I didn't know if I was coming back as well, and, you know, to be here, I would never have kind of thought that this was going to be, you know, on our, I guess, schedule for our team, but 
you know, being here and being champions is just amazing. And to do it with this, you know, this bunch of seniors and with this team and coaches is just unreal. And, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And uh, Seacamp named the MVP mm -hmm. of the uh, NIT championship game. She is not done playing yet now, right? Is that correct? No, as a matter of fact, uh, as of uh, Monday, she had signed with, with an agent. And so she's looking at uh, her professional opportunities, whether that takes her back to Australia. A lot, uh, a lot of people out there think yeah. there's a good chance she could get selected in the WNBA draft. So uh, a lot of opportunities. There's not going to be any shortage of suitors out there for Nicole Seacamp's so, uh, services when it comes to playing professional basketball. So uh, we have not seen the last of her, yes, at South Dakota, but uh, she's got a very bright future ahead of her, as, as most would have expected. Yeah, part of a great senior class moving on for South Dakota. All right, thanks to Jay Olson. Up next, uh, more from head coach Amy Williams on this WNIT championship and a look at the new basketball and volleyball arena that is almost done at the University of South Dakota. Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network is presented by Grand Falls Casino and Golf Resort, Dakota Land Honda, and South Dakota Corn. Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network is presented by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine and the Sioux Falls Convention and Visitors Bureau. Welcome back. The University of South Dakota women's basketball team grabbing some more national headlines for the Summit League with their championship this year in the WNIT. And the team still celebrating this week after the win over Florida Gulf Coast in that championship game on Saturday. The Yotes had a campus get together on Monday to share the love and shed a few tears. It was an amazing run. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but certainly looking at everybody that's here, but what we certainly came to understand is how uh, everybody rallied around this team, whether it was campus, whether it was the community, whether it was the state, just the outpouring of support, and certainly that was evident on Saturday night in the Dome. To all of our fans, what can I say? <laughs> I just never knew that it was possible to have over 7,400 people in the in the Dome to support this, this team, and, and just, um, the way you guys have come out for us has just been incredible. I'm getting all emotional. <laughs> but most of all, I just want to thank this incredible group of young women. But I think we witnessed something pretty special on Saturday. You know, it's only the seventh time in the 30 plus year history of the WNIT that a mid-major program has won it. And certainly to do it here and bring it home to South Dakota, and I can't think of a better, more fitting way to end the 35 plus year history of basketball in the Dakota Dome than with a national title. Well, it was the last basketball game in the Dakota Dome, and that's probably not a lot of uh, visiting players and coaches going to be too torn up about that. But anyway, next season, starting this fall, the South Dakota volleyball and basketball teams will begin play in this new arena on campus. It is connected to the south side of the Dakota Dome, and there is an open concourse between the two sides. Uh, the main arena will seat about 6,000 fans, and there are two full practice courts as well. The new locker rooms will definitely be an upgrade for visiting Summit League teams. And the new venue is part of a larger overall project that includes a new outdoor track and soccer complex and a facility to house sports science and physical therapy programs at the University of South Dakota. All the week in baseball and softball coming up in a little bit. But up next, there will be another new head coach in Summit League men's basketball next season as Scott Nagy leaves South Dakota State after 21 years with the Jackrabbits. Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network is presented by Grand Falls Casino and Golf Resort, Dakota Land Honda, and South Dakota Corn. Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network is presented by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine and the Sioux Falls Convention and Visitors Bureau. 
Welcome back. In this uh, past couple of years, there have been five new head coaches in Summit League men's basketball. The guys at IPFW, IUPUI, Western Illinois, South Dakota, and North Dakota State, those head coaches just finished their second seasons. And this coming season, there will be two more new faces. Denver announced a couple of weeks ago that Rodney Billups will replace Joe Scott. Billups was a player at Denver from 2002 to 2005. He has been an assistant at the University of Colorado for the last six seasons. And and the other new head coach will be at South Dakota State, where Scott Nagy has said goodbye after 21 years as the Jackrabbit head coach. He was introduced on Tuesday as the new head coach at Wright State University in Ohio. Yes, forgive me if I'm a little nervous. I've not done a press conference like this in a while, 21 years in one place. Uh, that being said, it would take a very special place to pull me away from, from uh, where I've lived for so long and where our families lived. And it would have to be a place that, that shared my values, that, that had a culture uh, of family, and, and had an opportunity really to win. That's, that's obviously very important to me. I brought two men with me, Clint Sargent and Brian Cooley, uh, who will be assistants of mine. I want to thank you guys for trusting me uh, and coming with me. And, and I know that we're going to do great things here, so, so thank you very much. Everything, without question, everything is in place here to have a successful college men's basketball program and it's up to us it's up to it's up to my staff and me now to, to deliver and I, I want to thank you guys for putting your trust in me thank you very much Well, as he mentioned, Nagy takes two assistants with him to Wright State. Another assistant will move on to be an assistant coach at Wisconsin. And Nagy's top assistant for the past 10 years, Rob Klinkenfuss, will stay in Brookings and put himself in the running to be the next head coach at South Dakota State. Well, two big honors this week for a player and a coach at IPFW. Summit League Player of the Year Max Landis was named to the Lou Henson All-America team. It's made up of the best mid-major players in the country. Landis is the first Mastodon player ever selected to this team. Uh, Landis second in the league in scoring this year. He led Fort Wayne in points and minutes and assists and three-pointers made and free throw percentage this season. And he did not win it, but Fort Wayne head coach John Kaufman was one of the finalists for the Hugh Durham Award as the mid-major coach of the year. Kaufman led the Dons to 24 wins. That is the second most ever at IPFW. And Kaufman has now won 40 games in his first two seasons as the head coach. He's the only guy ever to do that at IPFW. Baseball coming up next. Oral Roberts putting together another big, long winning streak, but it was a good weekend for Western Illinois as well. Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network is presented by Grand Falls Casino and Golf Resort, Dakota Land Honda, and South Dakota Corn. Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network is presented by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine and the Sioux Falls Convention and Visitors Bureau. Welcome back now to baseball. Oral Roberts has put together a six-game win streak. The Golden Eagles have won nine of their last ten games, and they have the player and the pitcher of the week. Brent Williams hit 562 in four ORU wins against North Dakota State and against Kansas State. Uh, he had six RBI, scored six times. And his teammate, Josh McMinn, is the pitcher of the week, a freshman from Oklahoma City. He was almost perfect in six innings of relief, gave up just one hit, one walk, and struck out four in those six innings. Oral Roberts leads the league right now with a 7-2 record. Omaha and Western Illinois right behind them. And the Mavericks and the Leathernecks met over the weekend in Omaha. Game one on April Fool's Day. Omaha's Tyler Fox was tricky. Seven innings, gives up one run. Fox is 6-1 on the season. Omaha wins game one, 6-1. Flip it around on Saturday in game two. Joe Mortellaro and two relievers hold Omaha to just two hits. Leathernecks win this one three to two. And in the rubber match on Sunday, Mark Garten goes two for four with an RBI. Western with 14 hits, and they win game three, 10 to two. Softball coming up next, the players of the week there, and another dramatic win in tennis for the guys at IUPUI. Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network, is presented by Grand Falls Casino and Golf Resort, Dakota Land Honda, and South Dakota Corn. 
Inside the Summit League on Midco Sports Network is presented by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine and the Sioux Falls Convention and Visitors Bureau. Well, the Omaha softball team is off to a 5-0 start in Summit League play, and the Mavericks won three at Fort Wayne over the weekend. They scored 57 runs in those three games. Sydney Hamas went 7-for-10 in the three-game sweep. She hit two home runs and drove in five in just the series opener. Hamas leads the league right now with 11 home runs and 32 runs batted in. Omaha pitcher Abby Clanton got the win in two of those victories at Fort Wayne. She went 10 and a third innings overall, gave up just one run and struck out 11. Meanwhile, North Dakota State played its first Summit League series of the season, won three in a row at IUPUI. Logan Moreland went eight for 12 for the Bison. She cranked out three home runs, drove in nine, scored seven times, and Moreland is second in the league in batting right now with a 393 average. And for the fifth time already this season, Jacqueline Surtick at NDSU gets in on the Pitcher of the Week action. Two more wins for her, both of them complete games. She racked up a season-high 14 strikeouts in the first game of that series against IUPUI. Surtick is tops in the league right now in wins and in ERA and in strikeouts. And finally this week, men's tennis. Oral Roberts at IUPUI, ORU with a 3-2 lead through five matches, but the Jaguars rally because they always do. Jack Newis with a comeback win in the number one singles match to even it at three matches apiece. And then Akshay Verma with a comeback win in the number four singles match. And the Jaguars win at IUPUI. It's 2-0 in the league. They play at South Dakota State on Friday. See you next week on Inside the Summer League.